Yeah. So uh, we're, it's recording now. So. so I think the first thing we're going to do is um, talk about this grid cell for conceptual space paper. And forgive me for the time trying to pronounce his name. Kriegskorte. Kriegskorte. Nikolaus Kriegskorte. Okay, there we go. And stores. <laughs> stores. Um, so, Florian, I think, I don't know, you told me about this paper. I don't know if mm. you came across this. And, um, and you want to talk about it. And then I read it uh, yesterday. Uh, and so it, I think that we can go through it very quickly. Um, Florian had a question he wanted to ask about some of the bullet points at the end of the paper. I had an observation of something that was confusing me, which is very a very singular point, which I want to talk about. Um, and do you mind if I do this? Do you want to do yeah, this? Yeah, no, no, no. All right, so basically, you, I mentioned before, Paul, this paper essentially uh, talks about the fMRI uh, grid cell, cor cortex grid cell study is done by Constantinescu. I hope I said that right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it reviews that paper and just talks about you know, where you can go from that. Um, right. uh, and uh, it was a nice review because I thought it was actually, it, some, it explained some things better than I thought the original paper did, which I couldn't understand some of the things. Yeah, which was funny. They should, they should totally, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, sometimes the reviews are better than the original papers because uh, sure. it, it gives the bigger context and, yeah, that actually explains some so of they, the... they basically just explain what that paper did and then they ask questions at, like, here's some things we might think about going forward. Um, I had one thing which I was surprised about and I was confused about. So I almost want to mention it. Maybe it's obvious to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Marcus and I had talked about this. One of the questions was, is why does this 60-degree um, preference show up in the fMRI signal? You know, where is it being generated from? Mm -hmm. And um, exactly. And what they proposed here, which I don't think we'd said in our previous discussions, is that Oh, well, there's all these conjunctive cells. We know about conjunctive cells. Uh, and the conjunctive cells represent both um, grittiness and direction of travel. Right? And I, I thought the term was more general than I could go. A bunch of combinations of things. But anyway, in this case, they say, oh, the conjunctive cells are this. They show this nice little figure here showing, yeah, so here's this grid. And now there's a bunch of cells in there which are grid cells, but they have direction of travel. Mm -hmm. And I think the term is more general, like you said. Yeah, like but they, don't make that features they didn't make the distinction here. They just said... Um, that's what the conjunctive cells are. <laughs> just figure, know, uh, figure 1B in that paper. Mm -hmm. And then, given that, then they say that these conjunctive cells are all perfectly aligned at these 60 degree angles, or 120 degree angles. And therefore, what you what you really do, and, and they're not in between, so it's not like, you know, so, and therefore, if you if the activity of those conjunctive cells, if you're measuring them, they'd be more active on 60 degree uh, points or directions than others, which makes a lot of sense. But I never heard of this idea that conjunctive cells are only going to be on 60 degree angles. Um, and maybe wonder, I had the impression, just switching topics a little bit, the head direction cells, because I thought that conjunctive cells were a combination of grid and head direction cells. Um, I had, wasn't under the impression that head direction cells were always at 60 degree angles. I thought they were more of a, you know. They're, they're everything. They're, they're, not, they're not the 60 so, so this, So to me, I'm trying to put two and two together. They didn't bring this up. They're saying, oh, there's these conductive cells which are direction and grittiness. And I'm saying, yeah, we know about those. But I thought they, they weren't restricted to 60 degrees. And here they say, yes, they're restricted to 60 degree angles. And they never mentioned the fact that they were derived from head direction cells. So, so um, I just thought it was like, okay, yeah, well, if you just say these conjunctive cells are all uh, tuned to 60 degrees, well, then, yes, I would see the signature. And that's how they claim that uh, this occurs. But I had never heard of that before. So that was the original reason. Like that was the when Doler and Kesselberry decided to go and run this first fMRI study, they were using that conjunctive cell explanation. Uh, the the light, the later explanation of walking certain directions in the rhombus was later the secondary one. Uh, the the, so, the sixty degree thing was the first thing. That how did, so I was confused. So they're saying, oh, that these cells are measured at sixty degrees. I thought they were a combination of head direction cells and grid cells, but. Head direction cells are not at 60 degrees. So right. how, do I, how do I reconcile those well, two? Well, one answer is that, um, so people are still trying to figure this out. Why does this fMRI thing occur? Uh, well, in this paper, they, they don't the, make that as a question. This paper was 2016. This paper says, here's why. There's no question about it. Okay, but in 2019, people are still saying, okay. why does this happen? Uh, okay. And, um, and 
when you talk to the people who are studying this question, they tell you that that 60 degree thing about uh, conjunctive cells, um, multi labs have tried to replicate it and failed. Oh. Uh, the, the original, I think, Sargolini paper from 2007, where they found that, um, that phenomenon of the 60 degree distribution, it may or may not be true, but other people haven't published contradictions of it, but people have tried to replicate it and, and didn't succeed and then just went and worked on other things. It would be nice, and it would also be nice if grid cells, I mean, heterosexual cells were like this too. That would be a lovely, photosynthetic, uh, you know, result, but they don't appear to be. So, all right, so this can is I, still, yeah. Can I quickly point out that that really, like, also depends on what your favorite model of grid cells is? Because if you're a fan of a, of a CAN model, then you'd like to incorporate as much as you can in these conjunctive cells. Whereas if you're if you build you if you com, come from an oscillatory interference thing, then that has no relevance whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I'm already I've already passed that argument. I've, I've accepted yeah. the hybrid model. Mm. That's the answer. <laughs> and, um, right, which also means that the the conjunctive cells don't have sort of you know that perfect organization or or even directionality tuning of any sort. <laughs> It's just an inhibitory surrounding that yeah, helps but, support but, but can like my, things my in assumption OI is, model. My assumption is, you know, um, when they talk about the oscillatory model and they talk about the, the CAN model, you know, you, there's usually not an explanation where the directionality comes from. Uh -huh. They just say, well, we have this directionality, here's what it's going to behave. Well, we know we have head direction cells. So just well, okay, yeah, and we, and, and how head direction cells come from. It's just kind of a mystery. And, and now I guess the, the point of the matter is there's an assumption outside of the the hybrid model or outside of the oscillatory plus CAM model, um, uh, there's an assumption that there is um, some sort of directionality imposed on the whole network. And so if you, you could accept the hybrid model, say, okay, the hybrid model requires that, you know, you have these oscillators that are tuned in a direction. And um, they don't explain where that comes from. They just say it mm -hmm. exists. Um, so here, too, I'm arguing that they don't, they just say these cells exist, and they show this lovely picture, so I'm going to explain how it all works. And you're saying that's it's still controversial, is what you're it's saying. It's controversial, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's, it's like a big important question. Like the Dollar Lab went and merged with the Moser Lab. The Dollar Lab moved to Norway so they could pursue this question. And so it's still in progress. So mm -hmm. they're, uh, they want to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that was my first question. They made it sound like a uh, uh, finished, you know, uh, settled problem here. The paper doesn't bring it up as an issue. Mm -hmm. So here's the answer. Here's how it works. Okay, that was my one thing about that. Was, and then. Um, starting on, um, well, the last couple pages of the paper, it's a very short paper. The last couple pages of the paper. I, I guess I have another question on that, is if we're working in these abstract conceptual spaces, where does head direction come into play? No, well, there's, there's no, no directionality well, of the head. Well, there's not head direction. We also, you know, we're talking about sensory things like your finger and your retina and so Yeah, on. but that would be a completely different, that's not head direction. So no, but there would be an equivalent. So we already made your argument. Um, that your finger touching something has equivalent to a head direction. It's your finger direction, if you will, if you want to call it that. It's orientation relative to the, yeah. it's an orientation relative to the dimensionality of the thing you're touching. So we made that argument. Um, so I, I, I just want to remind you of that. Um, no, no, I, I know about we yeah. I know what we've done here, uh, but I'm saying their argument. I don't understand the relevance of head direction cells when you're it's, working in abstract. Been, I don't think they've ever used the word head direction cells. Yeah, they don't talk they've about never it. talked about it. Oh, they okay. just talked about conjunctive cells. Okay. I'm saying. So somehow in these uh, conceptual well, we spaces, there's a conjunctive. Well, there's somehow. There is cells a, in that direction of the conceptual space. Yeah. So let's just review this. Um, the basic idea is that when you have this two dimensional sheet of cortex, well, head, you know, with we respect that it's happening throughout the neocortex, it's been found in the hippocampus and entomonic cortex, and now it's starting to be found in the cortex, right? So um, we, we speculate that this exists everywhere, and so uh, it's always going to be a sort of a, somehow a projection on two dimensional space, and, and we've talked a lot about how you can do it in yeah. dimensional, higher dimensional spaces and how they project onto that. Um, and I've, in the past, I've talked about the idea of orientation as an abstraction of head direction uh, and being in dimensions as well, right? So you have a, an n-dimensional orientation, you have an n, you know, n dimensional space, and, and my argument's been that those have to be discovered from the data, that there's not, they're not inherent. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when they talk about rats, 
when rats, you know, seem to do this two-dimensional grid field, and then when they start climbing walls, it gets a little squirrely. But other animals, apparently, that are arboreal... Um, like squirrels? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, like <laughs> arboreal and bats. Now, it, it seems to be more settled science that they actually develop three-dimensional grid cells. And um, so my thinking is, well, the rat, the rat would fly from early on, it'd probably dimension three dimensional grid cells as well. That's be my guess. Yeah, that this is learned from the data. And so... I, it, it, it's, we, can, we can table the question about concepts for the moment, because we don't really understand it, and say, well, it's going to be learned from the data, so let's figure out the mechanisms first. That's what I'm thinking about. So in the, in the Constantinescu experimental setup, something that they don't actually depict it ever, they just describe it in text, um, is that the, 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 the person who was, like the, the, the subjects in the experiment, the way they were controlling their movement through bird space is they had the equivalent of, they don't describe it exactly, but... They describe it very clearly in this picture. As having, like, two, essentially, levers yeah. and, like, a button, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and it, I'm just inferring this is how it worked, but, like, they, they basically decide how to move these levers up and down. One is, like, kind of a neck velocity. Uh, one is, like, a, a leg velocity. <laughs> and by moving these up and down and then pressing the button that causes them, even though they don't ever see this picture, that causes them to move in some direction in neck and leg space. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now, importantly, they never see this. They only ever see this. Um, but the point is, the equivalent of head direction in this picture is the setting of the two levers. Yeah, it's a sine, cosine, you know, uh, they, arrangement. They explain that here. Okay. <laughs> and I never even got that in the original paper. I don't you you had to, like, look at the supplementary data okay. and... Be careful. So yeah, careful. this this little four-page paper does a much better job explaining the experiment than the original. I think, but. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, they, they they were trying to they were trying to make sure that they never presented this two-dimensional field of birds to the to the subjects. Yeah, and they, so they never gave a person a joystick either. Yeah, yeah. There's always this like, okay, you have a it's sort of a yeah, and this is not a, this is a how far to go in that direction. It's like you know, it's like a. a Saltatory, like, you know, jump this far. Next basic principle. Yeah, that was interesting. All right, I think we can go on to the, the, the remainder of this. The, the, uh, I just broke my glasses today. Oh, no. Yeah, anyway. I got lots of them, though, Chief. Um, uh, then they go on to a set of bullet points of, like, these are things that we might do, or they might do next using fMRI, and all the fMRI things. So, right, so ways of data analysis that yeah, you could do. Yeah, so it wasn't very interesting, I thought. Um, then they go on to the very last part of the paper, which is next steps for understanding conceptual spaces. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so it says here, the possibility of a unified computational principle in the brain for encoding physical and conceptual spaces, that's what we talk about, that's what we're doing, um, that can be studied non-invasively in humans, being with fMRI, raises a host of tantalizing research questions. And so this is like some of the stuff you were just asking, so I like, how are grid cells dynamically constructed or co-opted to encode new concepts? Um, and uh, I guess they're saying is like, oh, do we have this two-dimensional grid cell thing and somehow we're managing it to, you know, map into higher dimensional spaces versus constructed? And I think it's a learned property. It's like, I think it's uh, that, you know, I argued a second ago, but we don't know. That's it. Another poll here, what determines receptive fields of conceptual grid uh, cells? Um, uh, and then they talk about borders, like, you know, a rat has borders, and so um, in, in these conceptual spaces, there may not be borders. Although they point out here that in the contents and rescue paper, they actually put little bars on the pictures to show that this, the birds can't get any taller than this, and the birds can't get any, the legs can't get any shorter than this. I don't know. There was a, um, sorry, if I may yeah, no, Go ahead, it's the whole point. He was very interactive. Uh, he, he well, just, I'll tell you what. But um, remember, you're online, so everything you say is, you know, it's going to be... Kind of, <laughs> will be using it. Well, use this, you know, proper language. Okay. <laughs> um, so there was this interesting paper I saw that uh, looked at, like, sort of the evolutionary origin of men mental models. Uh, and one thing, they used this idea from special relativity of, like, the light cone. Yeah. Uh, and the idea is that, like, the, the sort of space of mental models, uh, and in this case, you know, this basically conceptual spaces, is sort of limited by the... Um, the sort of range of behaviors of the um, of, of the organism, in the sense that like this is the sort of horizon that which we can like usefully plan into, and sort of there's an arbitrary element to it, right? Because at some point, yeah, you, you have to put a um, you like to say, okay, you know, stop now. But you know, even if you're like 
uh, projecting infinitely far into the past or the future, you're basically doing this within some sort of constrained space. You're sort of repeating, let's say naively, you're repeating a sort of same set of instructions instead of just like branching out into like an infinite number of yeah. paths. So you're saying there might be a naturally occurring limit, is that? When we yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Uh, based on the type of movements we can do. Or yeah, just every, yeah, exactly. I think the analogy to light comes sounds a little weird, but maybe I didn't understand it. But, but yeah, it, it is a funny picture. I think he just read about special relativity uh, and came up with a funny idea about yeah. mental models. But. Yeah, and then the, the next point here is they're talking about whether there's a global layout of grid codes, like it's over the entire neocortex, are these all coordinated? And we would say absolutely not. I mean, could we think that every little cortical column is building its own set of uh, models of the world, and there's no reason for them to all be lying throughout the cortex? But they ask that question. Um, and then, how are higher dimensional spaces represented? Um, and of course, we've been spending a lot of time on that, and I have a proposal on that. Um, they didn't make a proposal, um, but I won't repeat it now, hours, but you can you'll pick it up shortly. Um, and uh, then they referenced this one paper, this Mathis paper, 2015. So I read that, and it wasn't very interesting at all, unfortunately. <laughs> so, it was more like, you know, hey, how do we pack, you know, what's, what's the most efficient way of packing, you know, oranges? Oh, the geometrical thing? Right. Yeah. Th that's where yeah. the, you get these um, face center, uh, oh my God. Lattices. La lattices, cuboid lattices. Yeah. There's an exact name to this. But it really, it really you know, it was, it was a, I don't know, it didn't really help you understand how higher dimensional abstract concepts are represented. Mm -hmm. It's more like, oh, there's like that much iron in 3D. It's like, okay. okay. So, unless, did you want to say anything else about this? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, just a couple of small things. Um, so, for one, um, what do we think of this idea that so if there already is a grid-like organization and it's supported by, you know, some CAN or OI mechanism that sort of generates this grid, there's a lot of value to reusing an existing grid rather than building one from scratch every time anew, right? So, um, so one of the things they asked for, for like longitudinal version of the Constantinesco one to see, you know, that, that, that formation happen. Um, which obviously doesn't, in that MRI that doesn't tell you anything about the microcircuits. That was this question of... Um um, uh, are they dynamically co-opted? Yeah, exactly, yeah, right. That was the first one. And so I just wonder, how do we think about this in the concept of like the cortical learning framework? Like the, the idea of like using and reusing uh, existing structures, right, to, to map, um, you know, the, your cognitive sort of space like into that rather than, you know, building it like how I, do we... I have, a, I have a, a, a strong opinion Right, I would love to hear it. My strong opinion, it's just that, it's an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it goes back to the idea that the way, uh, my opinion, um, based you know, an informed opinion, but it's still not, is that uh, the ideal scenario would be that the, the cortex has to learn the dimensionalities of these, of the, of the, a section of the cortex has to learn the dimensionalities of what it's looking at. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that learning is a, is a longer term learning than the objects that you're going to represent in that space. Right. So if this section of cortex learns about three-dimensional visual objects, whatever, um, and it's built around a three-dimensional space, mm -hmm. it's going to have trouble learning anything else because it would have to start all over again. So it's like it first has to learn its basic dimensionality of its input space, and within that it can map every, it tries to map everything into that dimensionality. Mm -hmm. So if I, again, a simple, uh, three-dimensional uh, Cartesian coordinate space, you might say, okay, that's what I've learned. Right. As an example, not really. I guess yeah. it works well for, for sensory cortex, but what about higher-order cortex? I think the same thing higher-order cortex, because, it, it, because it, this is why it's very difficult for people to see this, the, the same conceptual ideas the same. If, I, if I've built my model of the world on a certain set of uh, conceptual ideas, and mm -hmm. you've built your model of the world on a different set of conceptual ideas, now we're, now we're presented with a new one, you're going to right. try to map it into your dimensionality. I'm going to try to map it into my dimensionality, and they're not going to be the same models. Uh, yeah, it's always very interesting when you compare. I don't know, silly example like political system systems, yeah. because Americans are so used to slicing everything, you know, alongst the, the politics like lines of you know Democratic and Republican, uh, you know, liberal and yeah. conservative. Whereas in many other countries, these things are a lot more multi-dimensional axes mm -hmm. because they have five and eight-party parliaments with you know, much more, yeah. like, where where the 
political fault lines are along different dimensions. It, it almost seems that it has to be the, the way I describe it because, and there's a, there's a, if, if this whole structure is learned, um, you, you have to have the structure in place before you can learn a new, a new object in some sense, like a new thing. Mm. And uh, and it, it seems like you know you can't relearn the entire grid cell structure and the dimensionality of it every time you do a new thing. It's just like then you forget everything else. It's like this is like you know. So, so maybe kind of another way to phrase it, like every cortical column would have its own kind of learned location spaces, and right. then that's co-opted to yes. learn anything new that that cortical column learns. Yes. But right. different cortical columns may have completely separate they would. location spaces, they would, yeah. and then. But in some things, you have to be able to transform from one to another. Like, yeah. if I'm going to reach out and touch this pen, I have to be able to transform the coordinates space in my visual cortex into egocentric, yeah. you know, hand-centered coordinates oh, and movements, on, and on. I have to be able to pick up my pen. So there's all these coordinate transformations that also have to happen. But there needs to be like some consistency across columns, right? Otherwise, you don't get a global fMRI signal that you can pick up. Like well, the, the grid angle, like the, the cardinal, you know, like the well, orientation. Right, but, but, but they're looking at, they're not picking up a global signal fMRI, right? They're picking up a, um, uh, a no, voxel. No, but, right, but an fMRI voxel is still much larger than a hyper. Not, not really anymore. Or uh, not, not with seven Tesla. Uh, but, the seven uh, Teslas get down to a third of a millimeter. Right, yeah. That's so true. Um, they're pretty small. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. You know, we could go back and look at the original data in the contents of the Nesky paper about. What were when they were getting these signatures? How small of a volume were they looking at? Yeah, and I mean, it wouldn't be inconceivable that neighboring cortical columns in, let's say, V one would be somewhat. There might be some correlation. Oh, yeah, between yeah, them, yeah, right? they, they won't be, be com might not yeah. be completely independent. No, I think there would be. Um, um, but even the question about, you know, the question about are they all oriented in the same direction? Like, you know. Um, um, it's interesting if it's tied to this mini column structure, you yeah. would have neighboring cortical columns would have mini columns that have the same orientation. Yeah, but, remember, but, but remember, you know, but the, the, we're talking about the ice cube block model yeah. here, and, and, it's, and we talk about this nice little thing, but it's really these like bands that are swishing into, into pinwheels and coming around in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not a lot of consistency over broader areas. Within mm -hmm. a millimeter square, you might get a lot. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess this goes to what they were asking for, right? So, uh, where they say future studies should use unsmoothened fMRI data and map the six-fold manipulation amplitude and phase continuously in that order to the, find yeah. all the grid cell regions and reveal whether the angle is consistent between this and within is the regions. This point that said better understand the global layout of grid codes? Uh, the, middle, the middle column? It's middle. somewhere in the middle column, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. That's why I was saying, I was arguing that, that there wouldn't be a global layout. Right. They're, they're asking the question, and I'm, mm. I'm hypothesizing. Well, but then again, you know, what is global, right? Is global five millimeters apart, or is global five centimeters apart? Yeah. Right? Yeah, um, I don't know. Global mm. would be the whole thing, I would think. <laughs> <A> whole brain wide. <laughs> All right. Global. Um, yeah. Okay, I mean, that, that was pretty much it. I just wanted to, like, ping our mutual understanding here. Um, <laughs> Also, they, they did mention this Moser paper that talks about that. Mm -hmm. sure you read that. Maybe one last thing. To what extent do we think that, I mean, it's known for navigation. There's probably six or seven modules, even though in rodent labs they typically record three or four. Um, just grid, because grid of modules. yeah, yeah. grid cell modules okay, because of this spatial scale. thing, yeah. right? They presume that there's one or two more that uh -huh. you could record from if they actually had arenas that were you know 100 meters wide. But there's some some people doing those experiments. Okay, like really That's really large tracks. I think I remember at Genelia yeah. they were doing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. but they need to run. Yeah, they had to run down the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> so they had the, the track it's huge, like cubes. All right, okay, that's that's cool work, uh, particularly for the people building these things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of data processing afterwards. Um, but I wonder, for conceptual space, do we even think it's necessary to have several different scales? I mean, you like I know that Marcos, like Mirko, and like the the, the feed paper, right, argues for you know, well, if you have an n-dimensional conceptual space, you can you know map it down into two D uh, grids, but the but they don't necessarily need to be a different scale, right? You just need different orientations. Correct. Yeah, yeah I think and the, different production. Too. There yeah. may be some efficiency arguments where if you have a hierarchical structure, 
set of scales, you can represent coarser stuff more efficiently um, than finer stuff. Well, but remember, we also so think that the, the reason we have multiple scales we think of the cortex are twofold. One is to deal with um, uh, hierarchy of, of compositional objects, and the other is also to deal with scale of the environment that you're sensing. Right? So in, and mm -hmm. in the mental cortex, I think but mostly adjusts with the scale. Uh, there doesn't seem to be hierarchical connectivity, and therefore mm -hmm. it's mostly just about the scales of the environment. So in the cortex, you might have you might need multiple regions to do compositionality, but I'm not sure that would even be scale. I don't even know what, what is the scale of bird space, right? right? It's like I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's no scale. I mean, we could relate to physical scales in the world. The rat has a big box, or a little box, or the whole hallway. Right. Um, um, right. Okay. So so the answer is we're not thinking that it's necessary to have them on different scales. That is a thing that is necessary for navigation because of the unique nature yeah. of you know large two D environments and the evolutionary pressures to map that. Well, I can say from my point of view, I've never asked the question before. So you're mm. the first person to ask that question. So okay. it's not like personally, I don't know, but I have not sitting there. Go, oh, yeah, conceptual spaces don't map with mine. You ask the question. Like, oh, that's an interesting question. Right. Um, I mean, if anything, there can't be too intermingled because otherwise it shouldn't show up in the fMRI, right? If they were actually like, you know, on top of each other, because yeah. then they would, you know, different orientations and different scales would mess up the six-fold modulation signal, I presume. Um, but it's then again, I'm just asking that. questions. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, I mean, I don't, what does it even mean, different scales of birds? Like, like you're you mapping like the sparrows or, no, you're going between, you know, pterodactyls and, you know, the midgets. Right. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's odd to talk to use these, you know, like two D navigational terms for for this, but yeah. because we use the term of so I, I have we kind of need I to. I have this sort of um, image in my head which I've been referring to over and over again, and I, I like it. I'm not sure if I've been able to share this image well. Is the idea that these quarter columns really have no idea what they're looking at? Right? It's just nothing. They're sort of clueless, and then you look at this data coming in. And somehow it has to figure out how the data is changing and do a spatial pool of like parsing up of the here are the different way different directions I can right if I'm going to divide this up into ten into ten categories mm. these are the different way, the way the data changes in, right. in ten categories and envision that can be an orientation column and something else would be something different but it doesn't know what it's doing so somehow all these questions don't really you don't have to answer specifically it's just like what does the data suggest right. the movement in the data. Suggest that how this thing gets divided up. Yeah. So, so to some extent, my question even epitomizes sort of the the ignorance that one acquires by looking at grid cells only through the lens of two D navigation, which sounds odd given that you know they were discovered there and that's how we all think about them or like we should think about it. But we have to kind of free ourselves from that thinking if yeah. we're gonna. Apply it. Yeah, to yeah. But I think that was the inside of the columns, uh, the work we did here, right? The right. inside was like there was this thing that evolved for this one task or a couple tasks that we associate with the hippocampus and the cortex, and uh, and it was probably very finely tuned for that set of tasks. Mm -hmm. And then somehow the court, uh, evolution discovered that you can genericize the algorithm. Right. That's the term. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's a word. Um, and once you've done that, you can apply it to any task. And let's just make a gazillion copies of it and hook it up to a lot of different things. That's, right. that's like a summary of it. But there will be differences between, you know, the antiviral cortex, you know, the, the, the hippocampus. And that's all like super fine-tuned to do these sort of things. And then um, and there will be messier structures. And then some, it says, oh, just rearrange them this way, change a few parameters. And now we have this generic version that doesn't really know what it's looking at. Mm. Um, so there will be differences, right. uh, but we're trying to get at the core. So I, I wonder with all this um, conceptual space stuff and studying what grid cells do in conceptual spaces, um, sometimes it feels like the analogy of like studying the elephant is a bunch of blind people and like you grabbing the tail and we're just studying like one part of the system and we can't see the whole thing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the level at which we're studying it might be right or might not be. Uh, the a lot of this seems like um, things that have been studied before in a more ma mathematical uh, uh, environment where people talk about um, manifold learning or 
embeddings, like embedding things into Euclidean spaces, is a thing that existed before grid cells were yeah. were were yeah. discovered. Yeah. And it, it may be the case that by studying that and 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 realizing like, wow, grid cells are just like the mechanism for how these spaces are implemented. Uh, but but studying those the, the original algorithms for uh, like local linear uh, landmarks and, and all of these and some of the stuff Bruno's been doing recently with um, with like manifold flattening um, it may be the case that we need a higher language like math to understand this and then and then this is like the bricks of how it all is I would argue that you don't need it to understand it I would suggest I would accept your that maybe that's a fruitful way of going about understanding okay yeah right um and and i so it's a good observation uh, uh but i think it, the, to me what i look at that is says okay we better read some papers on manifolds and see what we can learn about it um yeah. but i don't think you're going to find the answer there i mean there are going to be things in those think papers that just completely miss that we know have to be happening i mean so the whole idea of uh you know from what our goals here at Dementa are not just to you know, we, we want to understand how systems work and behave and generate behaviors and have sensors and measure things and have orientations in the world. And so it's a complex system for learning through sensing and moving. And I don't think you're going to find most of that in the manifold world. And they're, they're going to talk about these little mathematical structures, so that could be insightful for us. But I don't think it's going to give you the answer how does a, a, a cortical column do a, a sensory motor model of the world uh, moving and figuring out. In orientations and things like that. So mm. I, I, I've been never once in my life found a, a pure mathematical approach explaining something in the brain. It's always in, insightful. It helps you understand things, but it never is sufficient in my mind. It's just uh, I'm, I could be wrong, but the way it's worked for me. The question is just how do you like the, the serendipity argument, right? How do you make sure that um, once certain observations are made, that map you know, super nicely onto some theoretical argument that people have made 50 years ago uh, without even knowing about the brain, um, just thinking about, you know, information. And um, um, how do you make sure that when that happens, somebody's there to, to say, oh, blah, 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 we know this. this, this clicks with, you know, yeah. like something that is well explored, there's a whole literature on it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't. Other than that, you have a lot of people sort of exploring different places, and reading lots of different papers, and trying everything out. Yeah, I mean, you're just, <laughs> I mean, you're just hoping, right? That well, I, I think the trick here is, at least the way I've always viewed it, is you never want to get stuck in one subfield and say, okay, we're going to figure this all out by just meeting the ten people who are experts in this thing, mm. and then you got to go off and just look at all this stuff all the time, um, which I think we do kind of uniquely well here. Um, um, so, but then, that's what makes it hard, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody could tell you all the points you had to put together to make this thing work, it would be obvious. Right. <laughs> There's 10,000 papers, read these 15, and these are the points, which one this way, done.